I'm showing you 10 different van life and bus life electronic systems so you don't have to do any electrical math yourself. Let's get into it. I'm showing you how to connect all your wires so you can do your own electronics right now. I'm also giving you a few different sets of linked Amazon products that you can buy together in the video description below as an electronics kit for your van or bus, ranging from a cheap van life setup to a big expensive rig. This is Bridget's setup. She's a full-time solo female van lifer. She purchased a solar kit by Renogy. Doing so can help take the guesswork out of what you need. She has one big 12 volt lithium iron phosphate battery at 200 amp hours total. Powering this is four 100 watt Renogy panels totaling 400 watts altogether for her solar array. She also has a 1260 Sterling battery to battery charger so she can safely charge her house battery with her van's alternator. In the middle, you'll see her fuse box running into her positive and negative terminal blocks. All of this easily powers 12 overhead LED lights, a max air roof fan, wall fan, composting toilet fan, a Dometic fridge, a Propex heater, a computer charger, and her phone charger. So oh, I got like a, it's a 300 watt inverter. It basically can take like my hair straightener or my computer at a time and that's about it, but it's perfect for me. Hmm. I can't do a blender like a lot of people. I can't do obviously like not like a microwave. I can't hmm. even use a hair dryer, but like I don't need any of that stuff. Everything you plug into your vehicle cigarette lighter is basically rated for 12 volts. I am gonna help you create your own self-sustained 12 volt system in the back of your van so we can make it into a livable house. That's not boring as hell. Keep in mind, 12 volts isn't enough to shock and kill you, even though some of these batteries have enough current for that. If you accidentally touch the leads, you'll most likely not feel anything at all. This schematic I'm walking you through assumes that you're going to have solar panels and a battery isolator installed as power sources. These electronics are actually very simple. Every van I'm showing in this video and have ever seen has a setup pretty much just like this schematic. It's how you'll do yours too. I'm going to show you how to hook up everything except for a battery isolator to your system because that's going to be the topic of one of my next videos. I'll link it here once it's available. For almost everything, you're going to have two wires, what we call positive, which is usually a red wire, and negative, which is usually a black wire, running to and from each device. To connect a wire to another wire, you can use a wire splice. You put one wire into one side, crimp it, and then put the other wire into the other side, then crimp that one. To connect a wire to a bolt and screw, like on a battery terminal, you'll crimp a wire into a wire eyelet and then slide the ring onto the bolt and screw it down. This is Mike's setup. He has a 12 volt lead acid sealed AGM battery with a total of only 90 amp hours. He has a small solar panel on top giving him 100 watts of solar to his batteries. This is run through a PWM solar charge controller, the less efficient kind. So keep in mind this isn't much and won't power many things all day long, but it works for what little he's running. He can however power his roof fan all day long and night. He can also run his LED light strip a sound bar, a phone charger, a laptop charger, and a TV for an hour or two. He can use those things, but not very long overnight. During the day, his battery can power musical gear, like a small amp, an electronic drum set, um, and he plays his tiny concerts out the back of his van. It's not very loud, but it's cool to watch. <laughs> First thing you should do, let's connect your battery to the solar charge controller and put an appropriate sized fuse in between. And I'll cover fuse sizes later too. Remember to connect the battery first so it can power up and calibrate the charge system. Some MPPT charge controllers need to sense what type of battery you have first before sending power to them. On the battery, determine which terminal is positive and wire an inline fuse to it. This is the one fuse placement that will protect your entire system from damage. I used a 30 amp fuse for mine because my charge controller is rated for 30 amps. Then connect a red wire using a splice and run it all the way to the positive side of the charge controller marked battery. Now that one side is done, all that's left to do is run a 
black wire from the negative side of the battery to the negative side of the charge controller. Now you can connect your solar panels. Just for the solar panel, you'll need special wires with MC4 connections to connect to the panels. Link is in the description. If you wire a switch anywhere on the loop of either the battery or the panels, you'll be able to disconnect them for maintenance and troubleshooting. If you have multiple 12 volt panels, you'll want to connect them all in parallel, meaning you wire all the negatives together on one side and all the positives together on the other. You'll do this using MC4 Y branches. Finally, we are going to connect the load in such a way that allows you to continuously add electrical appliances to your system since you most likely won't be wiring everything at once. You'll need to purchase a fuse box. I recommend you get one with at least six terminals. From the positive side of your house battery, run the same size wire as you've used to connect everything else so far to your fuse box. I do not recommend connecting anything to the load terminals of your solar charge controller. Doing so will make your system run way less efficiently and your battery will suffer and possibly cause a lot of issues down the road. All the terminals of the fuse box are going to connect to all the positive connections of your appliances. Then run a black wire from the negative house battery terminal to what is called a negative terminal block. We are going to use this to wire all your appliances negative connections. Just remember multiple lights wired in a row need to be run in a parallel circuit. Pretty much everything else should be ran in a series circuit. For your inverter or appliances that have a high initial power surge like a refrigerator, you'll want to connect directly to the house battery. These appliances might not get enough power otherwise and may peak the system and shut off unwantedly. So just connect them directly to the battery so they can pull what they need. So to add more appliances over time, all you need to do now is connect a red wire to the fuse box with an appropriate size fuse, which I'll discuss later. And then run that red wire out to wherever that appliance is in the van. It might actually end up being a long wire. Next, run a black wire back from the appliance to the negative terminals, and then you're done with that appliance. Keep in mind, the colors of the wires are just so you know what that wire is. So if something does fail down the road, you'll be able to troubleshoot it way more easily and solve the issue. You see a ton of wires going everywhere on mine because I've just added a lot of appliances to my van. But I assure you, my system looks exactly like the schematic otherwise. It really is that simple. If you still find all this too hard and don't want to do any of this, you can buy one of the Goal Zeros I list in the description. It's a plug and play option, a big box that has all this already connected with a lithium battery inside and you just attach solar panels and you're good to go. Only downside is that you are limited on upgrading it and they can be a little bit more expensive for what you get. So this is Joe's van setup. He uses multiple DeWalt tool batteries to power everything. Yes, tool batteries like the ones you use for your power drill. He charges them with a 25 year old 300 watt inverter that he plugs into his van cigarette lighter while driving. Each one is only three amp hours, but that is enough to power his USB fan all night long to cool him while he sleeps or a 200 watt DeWalt light so he can see overnight. A uh, battery on a single charge is enough to power his USB fan for two nights. The tool battery also has a plug-in adapter so he can connect multiple USB cords to charge his phone. He says it's enough to charge his phone five times even though he normally charges his phone while driving. The van does need to be running so the inverter has enough juice to charge the tool battery. If he turns the van off, the inverter makes a loud screeching noise because yeah, of the lack of power. You can get all these things at Home Depot or Lowe's. While I was here, he also made me a burger from his van. It's awesome. A <laughs> uh, little note to van yeah, people. Good, yeah. put, it, put it low on the ground and it, the cold air will settle at night on the bottom and this van will suck it up and push the cold air up. Now I'm going to inform you all about the different things that you will need to create your power system. So battery differences, lithium versus lead acid. So deep cycle lead acid batteries cost less up front, but only last for one to four years. There are two main types, flooded and sealed. Flooded 
are about half as expensive, but require monthly maintenance. You have to maintain a water level in the cells of the battery. You also need to vent them outside because they release explosive hydrogen gases over time. AGM and gel batteries are sealed and hold their water in a different way, making them spill proof with no maintenance or venting needed. Uh, gel batteries take longer to recharge and output less power. If you go with lead acid, I recommend getting AGM batteries. For all lead acid, you can discharge them to 50%, meaning you only get to use half of the amp hours of what you purchased. If your battery has 100 amp hours, you only get to use 50. Using more than this can result in a drastically decreased battery life. A lead acid also has something called a memory. Basically, if you leave the battery in a discharge state for too long, it will tend to want to stay at that point and might not ever be able to return to a full charge. So lithium iron phosphate batteries cost more up front, but can last an entire decade or more. Now for a 100 amp hour lead acid battery, the total lifetime capacity might be around 30,000 amp hours. But for a 100 hour lithium battery, the total lifetime capacity could be as much as 300,000 amp hours. 100 usable amp hours of lead acid would weigh about 144 pounds, but 100 usable amp hours of lithium would only weigh about 31 pounds. This is because you can actually use up to 90% of lithium batteries. If your lithium battery has 100 amp hours, you get to use 90. Total costs for 100 amp hours of lithium can cost about $950. Even though the same usable amount in lead acid would only cost a less than half of this, about like $400, the duration of the lithium battery makes it cheaper over the long term per amp hour used. Lithium batteries also have no memory like lead acid does. When purchasing your battery online, it could be super expensive for shipping because of the weight. So I instead, I suggest you Google your local battery or RV shops. These shops are pretty much everywhere. I always call them first and I found these places are usually very knowledgeable and happy to discuss what you should get for your needs. If you want a way cheaper lithium battery, you can purchase them used. There are warehouses full of used lithium batteries for sale that were used in electric cars or emergency medical equipment. These used lithium batteries will still work very well with only decreased lifespans, but similar output levels. For lead acid, keep in mind wiring multiple six volt batteries together in series is superior to wiring 12 volt batteries in parallel because six volts have larger life cycles since they only have three cells and are able to pack more lead per cell. Their output is higher for longer. You'll need to purchase and wire them in multiples of two so you can make 12 volts. If you wanna calculate how many amp hours you have, by the way, remember series wiring doubles voltage, but amp hours stay the same. And parallel wiring doubles amp hours, but voltage stays the same. This is Mike's setup. Mike is what we call a weakened warrior. He only camps for a few days at a time for fun. He is running two 100 amp hour, 12 volt AGM lead acid batteries, giving him a total of 200 amp hours. Remember, this means he can only use about 100 of those amp hours. He has two 100 watt solar panels for a total of 200 watts going through a 30 amp PWM solar charge controller, which is the slower type. Still, he has no issues running two fantastic fans, a Dometic fridge, and LED strip lights all day and night, but only since he's not full-time. This setup would be inadequate for full-time use. The fridge would suck the battery down over time. <laughs> so reading a battery charge capacity. How do you know if a battery is full or empty? You could get a Victron energy meter and connect it to your system. This will tell you your battery's capacity and percentage. If you don't have the luxury of getting one of these $200 meters, you can get a cheaper knockoff. Otherwise, you'll need to look at the battery voltage on your charge controller's display. The meter in the middle of the MT50s is not correct, by the way. Don't use it. First, turn off the charge and turn off all your appliances, then read the voltage. It won't be accurate unless you do so. And honestly, for the most accurate reading, you are supposed to wait four hours, but we don't have that type of time. So 12.7 and above is either 100% or it means it's charging. 12.5 is 85% and 12.2 
is about 50%. 12.0 is 25% and 11.8 is completely discharged. Some batteries may be damaged and not able to sit at a full 12.7. For flooded lead acid batteries, you can use a hydrometer to test the water inside. This is the most accurate way to tell what charge your lead acid battery is in. You just can't do this with most batteries. So I installed my battery meter while making this video. I always thought running my fan on medium along with my Dometic refrigerator ran the battery down a good bit overnight but I found it only uses 5% of my 230 amp hour battery when I look at it after I wake up in the morning. After installing this, I now know I can play multiplayer video games like Borderlands 2 or Grand Theft Auto 5 on a 4K screen on ultra graphics all night before bed and still only use 20% of the battery after about four hours. But that's for a different video of mine to come. During the day, I can edit 4K on my powerful Dell XPS 15 all day long because the battery is being charged faster than I'm using it. This is Joe's setup. He is only a weekend camper. Joe has sleep apnea and needs to run a CPAP machine overnight so he can stay alive and breathing. Most of these machines only use 2.5 to 4.5 amps per hour. For 8 hours of sleep, this is about 20 to 35 amps overnight total. You would need at least 40 to 75 total amp hours of battery then to be safe. Joe actually has a 75 amp hour 12 volt lead acid battery. It's charged using only a battery isolator, which is okay. It's safer and faster charging than just solar. A battery isolator connects with his starter battery to his house battery and charges it only when his truck is running. So the starter battery is not drained when the truck is off. His house battery also powers door lights, a phone charger, and four LEDs. None of these are power hungry, so his system works well for him. But I only recommend the smaller battery if you aren't full time. To have a safer battery overnight for life support, you might want to consider how a larger lithium battery. So solar panels capture energy from the sun. It does not directly power your appliances. You store this energy in batteries and then connect your lights and coffee maker to the battery or your solar charge controller. Most panels will be at least 80% efficient for 20 years. To connect the solar panels, you'll need to get a wire with a special MC4 connector and a roof rack of some sort. I actually just use Z brackets to hold both of my panels in place. For extra stealth, but reduced panel lifespan, you could get some flat flexible panels that just attach directly to your roof. You'll find an example purchases in the description. To put in rigid solar panels, you'll need to first drill holes in your roof, unless you have a mounting system of some other sort. You'll need at least one hole to put in the MC4 wire through to connect them to the solar charge controller. To drill the hole and seal it, you'll need a metal drill bit the size just slightly bigger than the diameter of the MC4 wire. Drill it through and then paint the hole's edges so it won't rust. Then you'll put the wire through using a rubber grommet so the sharp metal doesn't rub away the wire's insulation over time, which would connect the wire to the frame of the van and cause electrical issues down the road. Atop the grommet and wire, seal it over with either 100% silicon or RV roof sealant which that is way more trustworthy. You don't want your roof to leak. I have old videos of me installing my solar panels on the roof. I'll actually link that in the description. This is Chris's setup. He has two 12 volt battle born lithium iron phosphate batteries at 100 amp hours each, giving him a total of 200 amp hours wired in series. He is able to use 180 amp hours since it's a lithium battery. Each one costs about $950. These are charged with two 165 watt Renogy solar panels, giving him a total of 330 watts of solar. The charge goes through a 30 amp MPPT solar charge controller by blue solar. When the van is running, the van alternator can charge the house batteries through a battery to battery Sterling 1260 charger. It cuts the charge off if the van isn't running so it doesn't drain the starter battery. It also stops the charge if the house battery is full. If you're going to be using your alternator to charge a lithium battery, you're going to want to want one of these. It doesn't let the high amperage of the alternator damage the lithium battery, which would greatly lessen the battery's life. 
Now, with a lead acid, it's not as susceptible to damage, but it will still lessen the life over time without a charge controller between the alternator and battery. Chris has no issues running overhead lights, a max air fan, phone chargers, and a Dometic fridge all day and night. He also has a Victron energy monitor to show the percentage of the battery power. Note that a normal battery monitor only shows voltage. To see the battery percentage, you'll need one of these. Solar charge controllers, MPPT versus PWM. So the job of the solar charge controller is to regulate the power going from the solar panels to the batteries. A good charge controller can improve the life of your battery and charge your battery very quickly. A bad one can drastically decrease the battery's lifespan and not keep up with the battery's daily charging needs. So PWM or pulse width modulation type of charge controller slowly lowers the amount of power applied to the batteries as the batteries get closer to a full charge. I don't recommend these for van life. I've seen too many reviews saying that these are too slow for the needs of the person. MPPT or maximum power point tracking is the best for van life in my opinion. MPPT controllers are able to convert excess voltage into amperage. The charge voltage can be kept at an optimal level while the time to charge the batteries is greatly reduced over PWM controllers. They are also more efficient when it comes to power loss. The only downside is that MPPT can cost twice as much, but like I said, PWM controllers might just be too slow for your needs. So when connecting your load to the solar charge controller, hydro appliances like your fridge or inverter should connect directly to the battery and skip the charge controller altogether. You could technically connect everything directly to the battery for a more efficient system, but the solar charge controller wouldn't be able to show the load's amp and wattage usage numbers. This is my personal setup. I have two new six volt flooded lead acid batteries wired in series to make a 230 amp hour 12 volt battery. Because it's a flooded battery, I need to fill the water monthly, so I got a Flowrite battery kit. I squeeze the pump to inject distilled water into all the cells of both my six volts at the same time, and it just automatically stops flowing when they're at the right level. I recommend you get this kit if you choose flooded lead acid batteries. To power my batteries, I have two 150 watt panels wired in parallel, giving me 300 watts total to my 30 amp Ep Ever or Epiver, however you say that, solar charge controller. I can also charge my battery very quickly using my alternator every time I run my engine through my Blue Sea battery isolator. It seems fully charged from overnight within 20 to 40 minutes of driving. I don't think I ever go below 75% charge though. I can run my LED lights, light strips, TV with Roku, max air fan, an air purifier, two phone chargers, and speakers all day and night. I also run a 40-quart Dometic fridge, a powerful laptop for video editing, even though I usually go into Starbucks to work on my videos, a sink, and a pump to fill my clean water tank from a bucket on the ground with a hose. Wire sizes. So wires come in different sizes called gauges. The smaller the number, the larger the gauge. Using too small of a wire in any situation can result in a wire heating up, melting, or even cause a fire. The important part is knowing their amp ratings. You don't really need to worry too much about voltage drops since we are working in tiny van spaces and the lengths of the wire we are using isn't going to be so long that a significant drop in voltage occurs. So based on how many amps are going to be flowing through the wire, use this chart to determine how big of a gauge you'll need. I recommend at least six gauge to connect all the solar panels, batteries, and solar charge controllers together because six gauge is rated up to 70 amps. You probably won't ever use more than this at one time in your van. That's like playing video games on seven laptops at once. When connecting your appliances like lights, TV, or fridge to the battery, or charge controller, I recommend nothing smaller than 12 to 14 gauge rated at 20 to 25 amps. Just so you know, 12 volt electronics that typically use less than three amps are gonna be your TV, LED lights, fan, speakers, phone chargers, and Nintendo switches. 12 volt electronics that use more than three amps of power are gonna be your fridge, your laptop charger, your electric stoves, coffee makers, warming blankets, and normal gaming consoles. So the van behind me actually had an issue with their wiring. Let's talk about that for a second. Uh, theoretically, if you have 610 
watts of power divided by 12 volt battery bank. You should have 50 theoretical amps that are coming down from the solar panels. The issue was basically that we had a 30 amp charge controller, which isn't sufficient enough to even handle that. Uh, we switched the controller out to a 50 amp charge controller, uh, much better quality, and it works great, except for the fact that now <laughs> all the wiring is done for a 30 amp uh, charge controller and not a 50 amp charge controller. So at some point we're gonna have to go back in there and rip all the wire out and put heavier gauge wire down, you know, in order for all the power that's on the roof to be coming down to the batteries. Essentially, we're only using half of it because uh, we have a bottleneck you know, with mm. the controller, with the wiring. This is Dwayne's setup. He has six total, six volt lead acid AGM batteries all in a line down the middle of his van. Each is 200 amp hours. He runs them in three sets of two. Each pair is wired in series, which doubles the voltage, but not amp hours. Then the three sets are wired in parallel, which doubles the amp hours, but not voltage. This gives him a total of 600 amp hours and a usable 300 amp hours since it's lead acid. He powers these batteries with about 380 watts of solar wired into a 30 amp PWM solar charge controller. He can power a 3000 watt inverter, a 90 quart two zone fridge, a Bose speaker, a mini oven and electric grill. Keep in mind, any electronic device that is used to heat up things uses a ton of power. His grill and mini oven run down his battery fast, but since he uses them for only a few minutes at a time, it works out. He also has an RV air conditioner on his roof, but he only uses it when he plugs into shore power. It's the surge in the beginning on the air conditioner that's really the big issue. The inverter would handle the surge, but I don't want to do that to these batteries. They're the AMGs and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if they were lithium, that might be a little different. Fuse sizes. So fuses protect the electronic systems from frying or the wires from getting warm and catching fire due to overcurrent. If for some reason, too much current flows through a wire with a fuse on a circuit, that fuse will break and open the circuit to stop the flow of electricity. A fuse should be rated low enough to break when it's either too much current for the rating of the wire because the wire can catch fire, or if there is too much current for an electrical device on the circuit. The fuse is intended to break before any more damage is done to the system. If a 14 gauge wire is rated for 20 amps, you could place a 20 to 25 amp fuse on the circuit to protect the wire. If a fridge is rated for five amps, you could place a seven amp fuse on the circuit. So too low and normal use will break the fuse. Too high and you'll cause the system damage or even a fire in the case of overcurrent. This is Brian's setup. He has 15 Nissan Leaf lithium iron phosphate batteries. Each one costs around $85 and is 55 amp hours at eight volts. So you have to wire them together in sets of three to make 24 volts. So he has five sets of three batteries, which gives him 275 amp hours at 24 volts. He's running 12 volt appliances though. So he has a converter that converts 24 volts down to 12 volts. Doing this doubles his amp hours to make 550 amp hours total at 12 volts. He also loses some power in this conversion process. The 15 batteries cost him about $1,275 total, which is actually a quarter cheaper than any other lithium battery. This is because they come from a company called TechDirect, which repurposes the used Nissan Leaf batteries after they have been used down to about 50% of their original lifespan. But remember, they are lithium batteries, so they still have around four to five years left in them. He charges them with 1600 watts of solar. That's five panels at 320 watts each. They are run through a 60 amp MPPT charge controller. All of this easily powers a 6000 watt pure sine wave inverter, a water pump, phone chargers, about 14 overhead LED lights, a propane heater, two max air fans, a microwave, and his residential fridge all day and night. He can also run a mini AC well into the night, but not all night long. So the inverter size. Your inverter converts 12 volt DC to 120 volt AC. So you can power home appliances, such as like a hair dryer, a coffee maker, or a laptop charger, even though you can get some laptop chargers in 12 volt DC. So I recommend you try to find and run everything in your van as 12 volt DC as much as possible because an inverter does not perfectly convert the electricity. It loses some energy through heat 
further draining your battery, but sometimes certain equipment is just too hard to find in 12 volts DC. So an inverter is rated in watts. To know how many watts you need to size your inverter, just look at the AC items, like the appliances that use the most power in your system and get their wattage rating. So then you only have to buy an inverter whose wattage rating is just larger than that item's wattage. Keep in mind though, if you're going to be running multiple items together, you'll need to add the item's wattage together to size your system. Don't get an inverter that's overly powerful for your needs though. You'll just be wasting more power through the heat. Get one that's rated just above what you need. This is Jessica's setup. She has the largest bank of everyone in this video. She needs it because she wanted to run the AC all night long. So she has a total of 28 Nissan Leaf lithium iron phosphate batteries. These are the same type of batteries that I showed Brian using in his bus earlier. Here, you only see half of the 28. That's because she's since got 14 more. This original 14 Nissan Leaf batteries weren't enough to power her AC and fridge all night long. She says it would cut out at about four in the morning. For all 28, she's wired them with bus bars in four sets of seven, giving her a total of 220 amp hours at 56 volts. But when 56 volts is converted to 12 volts, it multiplies 220 amp hours by 4.6, giving her a grand total of 1,012 amp hours and a usable 910 amp hours. Powering these lithium batteries are five 315 watt solar panels, which is a total of 1,575 watts going through a three part MPPT solar charge controller, which also doubles as an inverter and shore power charge controller. She can run a full fridge, a full washer and dryer, a TV, a few laptops, a toaster, a coffee maker, a water pump for a shower and sink, a water heater, two max air fans, two computer screens and phone chargers. For all of you who want to hook up your electronic system, but still feel you need more assistance or have questions, check my consulting link in the description. I'm offering paid consultations to those who do not quite understand everything in this video thus far. By the way, if you're still watching this video, please tell me you watched to the very end in a comment below because I read everything and will hit love on your comment to show you that I am here. I also comment back if you ask any questions. I post a lot of videos on how to van life and personal blogs from my life. If you wanna see how to install a battery isolator system to charge your home battery with the alternator, click here. Please consider subscribing to this channel. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you in my next video.